All right, good morning, and thank you for joining. This is Andy White. I will once again be your host this morning as we continue our uh, 2020 Summer Tech Series. Today will be a discussion uh, centered around the uh, SIP trunking configuration with the Epigee PBXs, along with an overview of uh, SIP messages and also some troubleshooting techniques to help you as you, uh, in case you run into some difficulties give you some tools to help you uh, solve some problems. All right, this is the, uh, the last scheduled uh, webinar that we have, but uh, maybe we'll take a look at a couple others. We will get these posted out there on our YouTube channel, the Epigee YouTube channel. So if you missed the previous discussions, I do recommend that you go back and, uh, and take a look at those, especially the, uh, the one on the system security. Okay, I have allowed about an hour to go through the uh, the uh, configuration on the SIP trunks. We're going to look at the outbound call routing, inbound DID configuration, SIP traces, and some analysis tools. Okay, when you sign up for service with a SIP trunk, also known as an ITSP, that's an Internet Telephony Service Provider, you're going to get an account with them, and they're going to uh, you'll sign up, and they're going to give you uh, you'll purchase some DIDs. A DID is simply a ten-digit phone number. You might have one or two or ten or twenty DIDs, but um, you're going to get some DIDs with them. And when you sign up for their service, they're going to uh, they're going to be able they're going to need to know where to find your location, where your QX is located. Okay, so um, I'm showing a, a simple uh, configuration, a network scenario. Actually, it's very similar, uh, actually the same as what, what I, we're gonna be using here this morning, what I have. Got a, uh, a QX that's connected uh, on the LAN side. You've got some IP phones. And on the WAN side, it connects to a firewall slash the HCP server, so it's on a private network. And um, and that is the gateway out to the internet. So when somebody out here on the PSTN network wants to call you and reach you on one of your DID numbers, they're going to send that call to the ITSP, and the ITSP needs to know of all the IP addresses in the world they need to know where you're located, they need to know your IP address so that they can send the call to you. All right, there's a, a couple methods that they're gonna use. One would be they're just, when you sign for their service, they're gonna ask for your, uh, your IP, your public IP address. And they'll just put that on your account. And that way, whenever you get a, a call from one of your DIDs, they'll send it directly to your IP address. And you'll be expected to obviously re receive and process that call. All right, and um, with that, you would also be expected to have a static public DID that would have the uh, the QX uh, connected either directly to it or through a firewall with uh, some port forwarding. All right, the second method, which is what we're going to be showing you here this morning, will be the uh, registration method. And that's where they give you, along with the account, they give you some credentials where you're going to register uh, to their service. Okay, and um, when you do, once you register, then they're going to, uh, at that point, they're going to identify your IP address and they'll be able to send the calls to you but it all starts with a registration. All right, I am going to be moving along pretty quick. We do have a lot of uh, material to cover. So the first uh, thing I wanna show you, this is the Epigee website. We're gonna log into the uh, support portal. Okay, we do have a promotion go going on. If you do have an older Quadro system, you need to upgrade that to QX with all the latest uh, Latest enhancements, security, uh, a lot of security options and features that have been added uh, on, onto the QX platform with the latest uh, features and software. So 
definitely upgrade and we do have a promotion going on so take advantage of that for you and also your customers if you haven't done so already you can go to the uh, support support portal and you can register to get an account it, there's no obligation in doing so but you will need that account so you can log in and get information on the latest documentation the firmware uh, you know manuals things like that white papers we have a lot of white papers as I'll show you here we're gonna just take you to the knowledge base support re resources and then there's a uh, ITSP configuration guides all right and um, configuring the QX IPPVX with the ITSP and you'll see here several uh, quite a few ITSPs that, that have been that are listed and these are different ITSPs that we've done uh, testing with and um, for whatever reason maybe some marketing purposes or whatever we've done a little bit more extensive testing with their with their platform and we've uh, um, so we, we go ahead and uh, we wrote up a document on that okay just because your, your ITSP is not listed here as you'll see here shortly it's uh, that's okay your uh, it will still work all right and we'll talk about that more as we go forward okay here's his uh, QX200 I'm gonna log right in jump into it If we look at the um, the network settings, actually I go to uh, status and I look at uh, system status and then network. It shows that I've got a, uh, on the WAN, I've got a 192.168.1.185. So that is a private IP coming from my uh, AT&T router uh, slash modem. And then on the uh, on the LAN, I've got uh, the default IP 172.30.0.1 with some IP phones configured on it. And I've also created a, a VLAN on the uh, on the WAN port there, which uh, which we're not going to be needing here today. All right. The um, the other thing I was going to show you is uh, if we look at telephony. There's the uh, SIP settings, and uh, you'll see that I am, it's actually using port uh, 5060. You can change that. You, you're not, you don't necessarily need to use port 5060. Uh, you can change that to something else. Actually, we recommend that you use something other than 5060. All right, just uh, to cut down some of the, uh, hacking attempts out there and especially if the system's on a public IP you can change that uh, that SIP port and then uh, you've got for the voice you've got the uh, the RTP ports you can see all the codecs that are available but down here at the bottom you'll see a range of RTP ports uh, I've changed mine from the uh, the default uh, 6,000 to 6,255. I've changed it to 7,000 to 7,255. I was doing some testing. So when I go to make a, a phone call, it's going to uh, use one of those ports for receiving uh, for receiving the audio, okay, for the R RTP. So I just wanted to uh, highlight that because uh, you will see that as we go through the uh, presentation. Okay, under uh, telephony, we also have a, a voice over IP carrier uh, wizard. And this is to help you configure your SIP trunk. You don't necessarily need to use the VoIP carrier wizard, okay, but it will uh, help you with some of the settings. All right, um, as you'll see in a moment, uh, you'll see how we, what the uh, VoIP carrier wizard uh, what it's actually doing for you and you could just as easily uh, do it manually but uh, you'll see that there's a drop down list here of uh, several ITSPs again these are ITSPs that maybe we've done some little bit more testing with 
Um, if your ITSP is not listed here, don't worry. We've worked with uh, literally hundreds of ITSPs over the years. And um, I've yet to find any that we will not work with. Okay, so don't worry. Uh, if your ITSP is not listed here, you'll just use the manual method. We're going to be using uh, flow routes today. So uh, I'll go ahead and select them. And as you can see, the um, it comes up here. And all the, the one advantage with the, in this case, maybe not so much of an advantage, but it pre-populates just a, a couple of the fields. Um, as I was doing, going through the presentation and uh, preparing, I noticed that this is actually incorrect, the server, because they have changed their server uh, information. So in this case, it's actually a, a hindrance if I was using the uh, Void Carrier Wizard, but I will have that updated. I can assure you, we'll get that changed with the uh, with the next release to come. I've already made it myself a, a note to take care of that. All right, so uh, they're going to give you an account, uh, an account. So we're going to register with their service. So they're going to give you the account. They're going to give you a good strong uh, password. You have to confirm the password. And as I mentioned, it's no longer sip.flowroute.com. I used this uh, yesterday when I was doing some testing and my calls were failing and it, it actually told me that it was a uh, old, uh, not supported um, route. <laughs> so it was my first indication. All right, so, uh, and then we're also, I'd recommend that you enable the, uh, and it is by default, the RTP proxy option. The authentication username, they may give that to you and um, they have actually, I'm going to leave it blank for now so we can kind of see the uh, the benefit of that. If they give you a secondary server, SIP server or outbound proxy server, they'll specify that in the information that they give to you. The next is the uh, prefix. So when you make an outbound call, this is what you're going to be dialing to. Um, this is what you'll be dialing to reach that uh, to make your outbound call. In this case, is you're dialing with a prefix code of nine, or you can maybe dial with a, a pattern where you pick up the phone. I actually prefer to use this method uh, a little bit better because it enforces a dialing plan with your, your uh, users. So that's the one we're gonna use. The user picks up the phone and dials uh, 10 digit. There's a single uh, question mark for uh, every digit. So there's a 10 question marks there. And then if you want to use the service for 911, if your uh, main account is also one of the DIDs, you can have that call come in and ring to one of the extensions, in this case, maybe 00. And then there's a failover to the PSTN, which would use one of the uh, FXO ports. OK, and then you uh, confirm your settings. All right, we finished that up. So let's see what uh, what it, it does for us. So we go back to, uh, let's go to our extensions page. Extensions management. I've got all my extensions listed here. And down towards the bottom, you'll see this, uh, this new extension. It wasn't there a moment ago, but uh, this is, was created uh, when we did the voice over IP carrier wizard and actually tells you that was added by the VoIP carrier wizard. And this is what we refer to as a virtual extension. The only thing that makes it a virtual extension is the fact that it does not have uh, a phone associated with, with it. So the attached line field is blank. There's no FXS or IP line associated with it. And then you can see the account settings. So let's do an edit on the extension, the admin, uh, administrative settings. We'll go to the SIP settings. And you can see we populated the username as a password and uh, the server, the port number of their server, 5060. And it is, they do require 
a registration. All right, so let's um, let's uh, let's see the registration. Uh, we, if we can find that in uh, status, SIP registration. And you can see here the very first uh, at the top, you can see that it is uh, was successfully registered. Okay, with that in mind, let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, actual registration process. We're going to look at the uh, SIP messaging. So we go to maintenance, system logs. Uh, on the left tab here, system logs, and going down the column, you'll see SIP registration. There's a, a scroll bar here on the right-hand side. You can get to the bottom by clicking on this little uh, arrow on the right side. It takes me all the way to the bottom, and at the bottom, you do have pages and pages of uh, information. We're going to be uh, using this, uh, this uh, messages, and we're going to be looking at that today, all right? so. Um, so let's look at the registration. You can see uh, we sent a register message. You can see it came from the IP address of the QX, uh, port 5060, and it went to their server, um, which translated to the, uh, the domain name uh, that they gave us. It translated to an IP address. And so the, we sent them the register message. And you can see uh, in there it has the account information, the user. It's a register message. And um, there is a contact field which basically tells them where they're going to reply. You're going to send all the messages back to this IP address, port 5060. So they get the message. And they return with a SIP uh, 401 unauthorized message, which basically states, okay, you got your information. I see you're trying to register, but uh, you're not authorized. So what do we do? In response to that message, we send the same register message. And this time, it you'll see the authorization uh, details. In here, there's the username and there's an encrypted password in there somewhere and it must have uh, been the correct password because they came back and replied with a SIP 200 OK message. The same sequence is going to repeat as it's, it's very it's the same process that are used by your IP phones when they register to the QX uh, with your SIP trunk registering to the ITSP. It's the same process repeated over and over. There's four messages uh, that that are uh, required to in either uh, each direction. Okay, so after we register to them, you'll notice that they begin to send us these uh, this options message. Okay, this came from them. We weren't getting these a moment ago, and you can see. I always tell people that if you want to see where the message came from, look at the line above the message buffer start. And you can see this message came from uh, flow route and was sent to the IP of the QX and is, is an options message. And they're actually trying to do a ping. And uh, so this came in at 9-2019. They did a ping to us and we responded right away with an OK. Uh, that was at 9-20-19. Nine twenty-one fourteen. a little less than a minute later, they send another options message in response. So that sequence is going to continue, and that's basically how they're trying to keep the, uh, uh, the ports open. Okay, we have a similar option on the QX, and uh, I'll show you that uh, here at some point. Hopefully, we have enough time. All right, so let's um, look at the uh, call routing entries. Okay, so we've got, um, we go to telephony, we go to call routing. I've got several uh, call routing entries in here previously, but um, I'm, I've got four here at the bottom. 
that were just now created when we did the VoIP carrier wizard. This is entry 9, 10, 11, and 12. Basically, if you pick up the, uh, it's uh, the 10 digit entry that we, uh, that we entered. So the user picks up the phone, dials 10 digits. It's gonna make an IP to PSTN call, which is a SIP call to flow route. All right, and if for any reason this call fails, this is a failover reason, if for any reason that call attempt fails, uh, maybe the internet connection is not working, maybe the ITSP is not responding for whatever reason, uh, there's a failover, it'll try to find the next set of matching digits and it'll try to make an outbound call on one of the FXO ports. Okay, you'll also notice the uh, the setting here by default. Remember, we didn't go in and create these. The system did this for us as we did the void carrier wizard. Um, the uh, As you'll remember from the previous uh, discussion, this uh, field here is called the, uh, the source type. I'll scroll up just a little bit, you'll see the uh, the header. It's the source type field the single most important setting in the system, okay? Which basically identifies if you're gonna use this particular call routing entry, you must be an extension on the PBX. Which extension? We didn't specify, there's a star there, but you must be a valid extension on the, uh, on the QX. Otherwise, you're not going to be allowed to use this particular uh, uh, call routing entry. All right, so let's um, let's just uh, go in. We're going to mark the logs. I'm going to show you how to do that. We'll go to maintenance, system log settings, and um, we'll mark this as a. Uh, I don't know. We'll call, you can see I've been using uh, test one here. So let's continue with that. I mark it test one. Just uh, put a comment in the box there and click all mark uh, mark all logs. It's up to you at that point if you want to save or not, but I usually do. Okay, so I'm going to make a uh, an outbound call. Let's see what happens. 1166. No routes found. No routes found. Okay, so we get an error. All right. Interesting uh, message. But if we go to our system logs, if we go to SIP user agent, You'll see the scroll bar on the right. Well, I can search for my log marker, and this was uh, test one. All right, so I've got uh, it. Actually, it created uh, two markers for me, and just below that log marker is the beginning of our phone call. So this, uh, we'll just take a look at this. We're going to look at the first series uh, set of messages coming from the phone. You can see this came from. Uh, 172.30.0.11 being sent to the QX LAN IP address. And this was uh, extension 100. And this was a, uh, a Polycom VVX 1500 uh, phone. Okay, so we get uh, what we call an invite. That's the start of any phone call. And these are the digits that I dialed 972 692 one one six six okay so we get the first uh, message we respond with uh, a trying message which is basically a, an acknowledgement that uh, we received the invite we respond with an unauthorized and the phone acknowledges that it got the unauthorized and then it sends uh, the phone sends another message same invite but this time it does have the username and password on it. So all we're doing now is just so far just collecting digits, two invites to uh, just collect the digits. And then we respond with a, uh, a trying message. At that point, we tell, we're telling the phone that yes, we got the digits, we're trying to process the call, and uh, we're trying to find the, the, uh, the call in the call routing table. Okay. Um, So now we send the invite out of the system, out of the WAN port to flow route, okay? 
and uh, you can see that's uh, going outbound right now. We send them the invite with the phone number and they respond with a trying proxy authentication required. Once again, same as we do with the phone, acknowledge, and then we send a second invite with the username and password. Get used to this messaging. You're going to see it over and over. Okay, and then uh, they respond with a trying and then a session progress. At that point, they are playing the message for us, no routes found, okay, which is a very, uh, not a very telling message, error message, but I do know why that they sent that, okay, so uh, you'll be surprised. <laughs> uh, when we dial the 10 digit number, they require a, uh, a uh, the number to be prefixed with the digit one, okay? So we're gonna modify this entry. Uh, let's go through the settings, the user dial 10 digits, and we're going to add in front of the the 10 digit number, we're going to prefix the digit one. Call type is IP to PSDN, which is uh, basically a SIP call. Let's take a look at some of the, uh, the settings that we have. When they asked for authentication, we've already given the account with that username and password. Um, we've already provided that on that extension 999, which is basically a placeholder, which is registering every hour with the SIP trunk. But if they, when we make our outbound call, they request that authentication, as you saw a moment ago. So we're going to provide them with the username and password associated with this extension settings. So use extension settings 999. There's the server, the host name, um, and the port number. If I if I had that account information, I could have also populated it and put it right here into this uh, username and password field instead of using that um, use extension settings, and it would have worked just as uh, as well. Okay, we've um, here's some other settings. You know, we're not going to go through all these, but you can see uh, there's one uh, which is RTP proxy, uh, which uh, suggests probably enabling that one. Again, this is the most important setting in the system. This is your source type, identifying the originator of the call, which basically states that uh, we're going to allow any extension. Uh, because it, we specified the pattern, you could have actually said this is only called only allowed from, say, maybe extension 100 or something. But um, all right, we'll come back in a moment. We'll uh, modify the call caller ID. Okay, so all I did just now was I prefixed the digit one. I'm going to redial my call. Welcome to Epigee Technologies. If you know. The call went through this time. Okay, so that was uh, that was good. But you can see, uh, you know, you're going to run across uh, little errors like that. Okay, so let's do uh, make another change. I want to send out a different, uh, a unique caller ID because right now when that call goes out, if I look at that last call. If I look at the uh, the last call that, that went out here, just scroll up here real quick. Um, the the, uh, the invite that went out, the caller ID that was used, the contact was actually that uh, 491352, that was the account information. So that's what's gonna show up for the, uh, the caller ID, all right? So that's not good. You want it to probably be one of your DIDs. So let's uh, let's see how you can modify and send out a, a caller ID. So let's uh, we're going to edit uh, one of the nice changes. So you got this gear wheel here, and you could do a modify right right there on that table. So we're going to uh, by enabling this checkbox down here in the bottom, which is uh, enabled by default. The same page that we look at the source type, you can also modify the caller ID. The first field is how many digits you're going to delete. Okay, and we're going to um, delete whatever's there. We're going to remove the extension 
caller ID and replace it with the uh, prefix 972-692-1234. Okay, let's just go with that, with that DID and see what happens. All right, before we make our call, let's go in uh, maintenance, system logs, and then we'll go to, uh, we're just gonna mark this one test two. Click mark all logs and redial. Check your external phone line. What? Check our external phone line. Now what happened? Okay, so now we got another error. So let's uh, take a look at it. All right. Um, SIP user agent. Let's go down. We'll find test two. Okay, the first part, we're just collecting digits from the phone. So we're not going to go through all that. 972-692-1166 is what I dialed. Okay, you can see my one. Uh, that I prefix one nine seven two six nine two one one six six. My contact number it now has my modified caller ID. All right, and um, you can see it. Uh, I'm telling them to send the messages back to my public IP, and uh, also just a kind of FYI, this is the audio port that's going to be using port number 7136. That's where the audio will be sent to me if the call were uh, successful. So they respond with a trying uh, authentication required. They acknowledge that they got the authentication. We, we acknowledge that we received the authentication required. This time we send back the username uh, authentication information. Has the username uh, 972-692-1234, that might be our problem. I'll clue you in right now. Uh, that is the problem because I've put in the caller ID uh, there in that field, but they, they need to see the, um, the account name in there, okay? Because when they get that message, what do they do? They respond with a bad AU, bad authorization coming from flow routes. Okay, so they did not like my authorization details. There's something wrong with it. And if I look at the username field, it has my caller ID in there, my modified caller ID. All right, so let's go to see how we can correct that. Okay. Um, I'm going to go to my extension 999. That's where the account resides. You can see it has the username in there. But in the authorization field, that username is getting written overwritten by my uh, caller ID. So I go to the SIP advanced settings and you'll see that there is an authentication username here on the advanced settings. And I'm going to populate it or change it and use that. All right, let's go back. We'll see if we can mark the logs again and we'll make another uh, quick test call. Okay, this is uh, test three. Welcome to Epigee Technology. Okay, that call was successful. Let's look at it. And by the way, the reason you heard uh, check your external phone line on that last call was because it failed over to my FXO ports. Remember that outbound call failed and it failed over to FXO? I don't have any FXOs connected, no POTS lines connected, so that's why it didn't get dialed to them. Okay, so we're collecting digits from the phone at this point. Uh, we send the outgoing invite. And then when they ask for the authentication information, you can see in the username field, we have the proper authentication information. So at that point, the call, they gave us, sent back a ringing message and the call was able to uh, proceed. Okay, um, now let's, uh, we haven't made an inbound call. So, so we've got our outbound working successfully. Um, had to jump through a couple hoops, but, um, you know, to get that working, 
hopefully you won't have to because uh, you've seen some you know one it you know from one itsp to the next they're not all the same so uh you know they might be different i do have a uh, a did with them it's uh nine seven two three six six zero zero nine nine okay let's see what happens when i call that did first thing i want to do is let's go up let's mark the logs so we can see what's uh, what's happening mark the logs go ahead and uh, i'm going to make a outbound call here from another actually another site All right, place the call. I get an error message. It's trying to connect. Please wait. Okay. All right, so why did we get that message? Number dial doesn't exist message. Let's take a look at our logs. Where we test uh, four. And um, actually, we didn't get a uh, an incoming call at that point. Okay, I've actually I'm expecting to see a uh, an incoming call here at this point. Let's see nine seven two. Make sure I dialed it correctly. Nine seven two three six six zero zero nine nine. All right, let's see if we can refresh. Okay, so um so at this point, I should be getting the uh, the incoming call uh, from them, and uh, I'm not. So I can't. What I always tell people is, you can't process a call that you don't receive. Okay, so um, so let's take a look and uh, make sure everything's registered with them, because they should be uh, sending me the phone call. And we'll make another call, see if it comes through. Number dial does not exist. Okay, we did get the call this time. Uh, I guess it was there last time too, because I don't know, maybe the logs didn't refresh for me. Okay, so after we marked the, uh, gave the log marker, you can see the incoming um, call. Okay, this is coming from flow route to the QX. And you can see they're, they're trying to send the call to us, 972-366-0099. They're in the invite header. And also the to field. Okay, we can process a call to either one of these fields, okay? There's a, actually a setting that, that uh, you can set. By default, we're going to be uh, processing the call to this particular number. Notice that it has a plus one in front of it, okay? So we have to enter the call a, uh, number, our DID, exactly as as they have it. Okay, plus one, nine, seven, two, three, six, six, zero, zero, nine, nine. We respond with a trying. And then we respond and tell them not found. Basically, you know, they're trying to contact a number that doesn't exist in the system. It doesn't exist. We haven't added it yet. Okay, so let's uh, see what we do with our, how we uh, enter and uh, populate our DIDs in the system. So you can go directly to your extensions management table. 
The first thing that the system does, and this is important to understand, the first thing that we're going to do is uh, on a SIP messages is we're going to try to find a match, matching pattern for the digits we received right here against uh, the extensions in the SIP uh, address field. Okay, if it finds the match, it'll ring the extension. Okay, where do you end up populate these settings? Well, let's uh, go ahead and see. I think I can use this extension um, 105, I believe. So let's go ahead and uh, I'll just do an edit on this extension 105. And we used it previously for the username for the account, but we can also use it for the uh, actual the DID number. Remember, you have to put it exactly as they're sending it to you. If you leave the plus out or the plus one, it's not a match. You don't need these other fields. You just need to enter the DID. All right, um, I will go ahead and uh, redial from my phone over here. All right, and um, number dial doesn't exist. What do you mean it doesn't exist? We just entered it. Make sure there's no space. Make our call. Okay, number dial does not exist. Let me just check one thing here. Make sure we're still getting the call. Okay, it was a uh, test uh, five, I believe. All right, we're still giving it a uh, a not found here. Let's see, plus. So two three six six zero zero nine nine. Okay, there is a match. I may have entered. Oops, sorry about that. Let's see. There is a table, okay? Uh, it's called general config. CGI. You have to enter in at the uh, at the top after your IP address general config. CGI. This is just it's a page that has all the uh, SIP settings, uh, different parameters, different things. Over the years, we've accumulated uh, this kind of a uh, for different. Um, ITSPs, um, you um, there's different settings here that will be you need might need to enable. Um, one of these is the do not send the external reinvite. That's very common uh, that you need to enable it, and then also the uh, the force uh, hold music. Okay, either one of those. Um, there is an option here. This is the one I think I was looking at. They ignore the two header and they SIP invite uh, request. Um, that wasn't enabled, so I should be able to get that call. All right, let me just check something here. 
Now they did send it to us. Um, I told you we can uh, process the call uh, ordinarily. Process we can process it to either the um, It says the two was not found at uh, one, I think one setting that might be causing that. All right. Sorry about that. It should be uh I tested this the other day. This is the problem with doing a live demonstration. Let's see. Okay, that time it is ringing. Okay. So as I mentioned, we can process to the um, the uh, either the to field or the the header uh, invite. Let me just take a look at that real quick. Okay, and uh, when they send us the call, there's two two fields. Uh, evidently, we're processing to the uh, the one uh, nine seven two, which is in the invite header. Uh, there's also the uh, the two header, but I guess this one actually has the uh, IP address in it, so that's probably why it's uh, processing to that one. All right, so um, that's good. That you can see uh, how you you know things like that are going to happen. Okay, you can put your DIDs here on the extension, or you can put uh, the DIDs in the call routing table. So why would you do one versus the other? All right, glad you asked. This is uh, extension 105. I'll just replace the, the ID with the extension number once again. All right, let's put the same DID. We're going to remove it from the extension 105, which just rang here a moment ago after a couple tries. Sorry about that hiccup, but uh, that's good. That's uh, how we learn. Okay, so in the call routing table, I'm going to add the DID number. And um, so if the call, the DID is not found in the extensions table, in the extensions management table, it will check the, uh, the call routing table to find the same matching pattern. All right, and... Um, so we're going to enter the DID here, one plus uh, the 10-digit DID. It's an incoming call, so we're going to receive that call, and we need to delete, uh, let's we're going to delete 11, all 11 digits, the one plus the 972-366-0099. We delete all digits. And we're going to go to the extension uh, in the PBX, so the call type. It's an incoming call. Call type will be uh, PBX because we want to reach one of our extensions which extension 105 so we receive these digits we delete all the digits and replace them with our local extension number all right this call no settings so uh, you don't need to change any settings there for the incoming call you do need to change the source type by default for security purposes we put the PBX uh, call type uh, in, in this field, okay? This call came to us externally. It was actually a SIP call that is coming in, so we need to open up this call routing entry a little bit so it can be received and uh, processed from outside the office. Okay, so a moment ago, the DID was on the extension. I moved it to the call routing table. You'll see some benefits here in a moment. I call that number again, and <laughs> it's going to fail because why? It wants to see the plus one, and I don't know why the plus one did not pick up on the uh, when we added in the extensions. Because every time I've used this, it's always wanted the plus one. But instead of uh, deleting 11 characters now, we need to 
to delete the 12. Let me redial. Okay, that time we received the call and it rang the extension 105 right here beside me. All right, so what's the advantage? You put the DID in the extensions table, put it in the uh, call routing table. Um, the advantage here is you can also take it, uh, you can use, uh, there's a lot of things you can do in a call routing table. One of those is to have uh, some time of day routing. So maybe between eight and five, you want to ring to the auto tenant, or maybe you want to ring to this extension 105. After hours, maybe you want to go to the night service auto tenant or to an external number or something like that. So you can do that. Uh, you can take advantage of your scheduling up at the top. You'll see schedules. And um, for example, the, you got a company schedule. It has a schedule ID. The schedule ID you can assign a, to a button on the, the key uh, on, a, on the phone. And uh, they can toggle that schedule manually. They can see when the schedule is active because uh, when the schedule is active, as it goes through the, through the time uh, during the day, when that schedule comes up, that, that light will be, uh, it'll be lit. Okay, so they can, uh, they can also change it manually. So you can take advantage of one of uh, the schedules that you can create and you can assign that to your call routing entry. So we'll go down here and we're going to sp basically specify um, bottom left hand corner, date and time settings. About the fourth or fifth page in, it gives you the time and date settings and we're going to use the schedule the one called company schedule and we created uh, that entry and I'm going to duplicate this entry so we need a second entry so you can have a modify uh, duplicate entry for after hours maybe we want it to go to the auto tenant zero zero and on this case in this case we do not need the date and time settings okay this is like a a catch-all. I'll show you that. Finish. Okay, so what I've done is it's going to check the call routing table top down, finds the first matching pattern. In this case, it's going to ring to extension 105. Uh, it's the first one that it matches, but it's only going to do that if that schedule is active, whether it be through the, the time period, whether it's active, or whether it's been active because they've manually turned that schedule on. Okay. Um, then if that schedule is off or it's after hours, it'll find the next matching pattern. This is kind of like a catch-all. We didn't need to add a schedule to this one because it's just, uh, it'll catch uh, any time frame that's outside of the first, first uh, entry. So during the day, it'll go to 105. After hours, it'll go to 00. So that's one of the advantages of putting your DIDs in the call routing table. You could, let's say if you have 20 DIDs for the customer and you've only uh, assigned uh, maybe half of them to extensions, you could put those in the uh, extensions uh, management to each individual extension. And then if you want, you can have certain DIDs in here in the call routing table, or you can even use a, uh, a, a wild card here at the end, like a, a two question marks, kind of like a, a so it's going to catch any DIDs in the range from uh, the 366000 all the way to 99. So if it doesn't, then find the entry in the call extensions table, extensions management, it would find this particular entry and it would uh, match that pattern okay so um, so just keep that in mind okay we're going to be running over today but I'm going to continue the session if someone needs to drop off that's fine um, there's several things that I, I do need to cover so I apologize for for going over but um, some real important information all right so let's talk about the firewall so I, you're going to want to enable your firewall, especially if it's on a public IP. 
but even if it's uh, in a um, on your private network, private IP like mine is, you want to at least, very least, have it set, enabled set to low. You can do that. And in the filtering rules, you're going to want to add in the SIP access, you can control who's allowed access, who's going to be sending you SIP messages. Okay, you want it, you can, uh, if you only have a uh, trunking service, um, you know, the, with the ITSP and you don't have a lot of remote extensions or something, you can allow your SIP traffic to be uh, enabled. So you're only going to receive SIP, mess SIP messages. The, the QX is only going to be processing SIP messages from a group. That group name that I created was called management, uh, well, management access. Um, There's a second group, actually, is probably the one that I wanted, is the, uh, the SIP access. So you create a group up here in IP groups called SIP access, and then you define all the, the range, uh, all the IPs that you're going to allow SIP traffic from. You could do the same thing for your management access, so you can only allow management access from certain uh, IPs. Okay, so this will, um, uh, the, the QX firewall will only listen to traffic. And by the way, whenever you make any changes, as you notice, it came up disabled. So you, you, you need to enable, I made that change and uh, I went off to made, you know, to some place management access. I forgot to enable the, the, uh, the entry. Very common mistake. When it, you make a change, make sure you go back and enable that uh, that setting. All right. So in this case, the uh, system is only going to be processing traffic from those IPs and SIP access. Okay, but it's still those uh, all that messaging is still going to be received by the QX uh, WAN IP address and it still has to be processed. Okay, and um, it's always best, especially on, on a large system. Uh, it's always best to front the system uh, that I found. Uh, you want to front the system with a, a, a good firewall that can is uh, you know that does exactly that. It can uh, um, you can put rules in there so that you're only allowing traffic from certain IPs and you're only passing through the uh, that traffic that uh, that the QX needs to uh, to handle. Because otherwise, it's left uh, having to every single packet comes in, it has to look to see if it's allowed or not, and you know it does. There's a lot of overhead that goes along with that. Why not take that overhead, uh, that load off the system, and put it into uh, the firewall in front of it? On a smaller system, you probably don't need to, but in a large office, you, you definitely want to do that. All right, the system also has a uh, SIP IDS mechanism. Um, where you want to add, you enable SIP IDS. SIP IDS is what's going to block external uh, parties that are trying to register accounts to your system. They're trying to make calls through your system. If it sees the offending IP, uh, it will uh, block it. You can put in uh, your SIP trunk IP addresses. They're going to give you a range of all their IP addresses, their friendly IPs. Put those in the SIP IDS so that that IP does not get blocked. Anything in this exceptions list, we're not going to block. You notice I got my local subnet in there as well, because a, a local phone could be blocked if uh, for some reason it had the wrong uh, account information. All right. Um, so we looked at the general config.cgi. Um, let's go to uh, make a change on our, our setting here. Just look at a couple failure scenarios. Uh, which we've already seen, uh, some plan, some not. <laughs> so let's we make an outbound call uh, again, and let's change up the the server information that we're sending the call to. Uh, well, let's uh, put some other uh, IP in there, some fictitious IP. And let's see what happens when we try to make a call to it. Just um, so you can see some of the uh, error messages that you might 
come across and what's going on behind the scenes. Mark the logs, make a call. All right, the call has been made. You notice nothing's happening, it's pretty quiet. Trying to connect, please wait. Trying to connect. Trying to connect, please wait. Okay. Trying to connect, please wait. And that will continue here for another second or two. Trying to connect, please wait. And check your external phone line. Now it failed over to my POTS line, the FXO, and, it, and now it said uh, check your external phone line. So it gave up. Okay, after a period of time, it did give up. Okay, let's uh, look for our test call, test marker. All right, we get the invite from the phone. We're gonna skip all that. Okay, we're sending an outbound message to that IP, that fictitious IP address. So this could be what happened if your internet's having problems, issues, the ITSP's having problems, uh, connecting out through the internet. That message went out at 10.05 and 55 seconds. There's the invite to the number I'm trying to call. We should get an immediate response from the ITSP. We do not, okay, obviously it's fictitious. So we send another invite and no response, another invite, another invite, another invite, another invite. And that continues um, at from 10.05.55 to 10.06.27 for a duration of about 30 seconds. It continues to send those invites out and then um, then it tries the FXO and then we get a, uh, a message here locally that says check your external phone line. So it attempted uh, for 30 seconds to make that uh, call happen and never got a reply, gave up, tried the FXOs. Okay, that's basically all we're, we want to show you on that. Um, you've also uh, let's say if you wanted to, uh, let's modify this entry. There's a, um, you can change the, uh, the session. This is the failover timeout. You've probably seen this, probably wasn't sure what it's, what it does, but this is a failover and you can shorten that time frame that it's going to fail over. So this is, uh, we're gonna reduce that to say five seconds. All right, and I'm not gonna mark the logs, but let's go ahead and just redial. 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 1,005. Okay, so about five seconds, it uh, failed over, tried the FXO, and uh, so it reduced the 30 second timeout down to uh, five seconds, okay? So you can have shorten those timers a little bit. Okay, um, uh, let me just correct that before we go any further. Let me just uh, correct that uh, IP in case we do need to make another call here. Again, I apologize for going a little, uh, a little longer, but um, this is recorded so uh, we can have it for future. Let's see if the call completes. Okay, good. Okay, so uh, we're back to where we started. Um, the other thing you can do uh, if your system is behind a firewall and you're having problems keeping that port open, you, the IT guy doesn't uh, want to open those ports for you, and uh, which isn't unusual. Okay, you can go into the SIP advanced settings. Just like we saw Flowroute sending us an options message our way to try to keep the port open, we can ac actually, we can send an outbound uh, message to keep, uh, send keep alive messages uh, as well outbound so let me go ahead and enable that so it's going to register um, the account the flow route account it'll do so about once every hour just like your phones but now it's going to send out the uh, 
what they call a, uh, a keep alive. If we look at maintenance, SIP registration. All right, SIP registration, let's go to the bottom. And um, let's see, there's an options message that's uh, coming in. Let's see, it hasn't gone out yet. All right, let's just give that a moment. And there it is, there's our outbound options message. It's going from the, uh, from the QX to them. So we're sending them an options. Uh, basically that's like a, a ping and they respond with a 200 okay and that's, I, short net so that's about every 30 seconds that will be taking place that'll keep the uh the help to keep the port open as well okay the um if you are behind a firewall okay you need to provide the itsp with your public ip address okay and you could do that with the the system is doing that with this uh, nat traversal settings uh, NAT traversal means it's behind a NAT, a private, it's on a private network. So it's behind a device that's keeping track of all the different sessions on its network. And it has a single pub, uh, interface out to the uh, internet. Okay, when you make a call or when you register to the ITSP, they need to know what your public IP address is. So there's a couple methods that they're gonna find out. You can use the stun server so you could go out, the system would, if you enabled the stun server, it would go out, contact the stun server, ask the stun server what is the public IP and also what are the ports being used, which is important. And the stun server replies, and that's the information that it would use when we make an outbound call or register message. Or you can use manual NAT traversal where you basically specify, this is my public IP, this is my port number, 5060. And the same goes for the RTP, but with the RTP, you've got a range of ports. Okay, so when I make that outbound call, um, I'll just mark the logs here real quick, uh, test eight. When we make the uh, outbound call, it goes through, rings, and test eight. Oops, this is still registered. We need to look at the SIP user agent because that's going to be uh, be looking at your actual call. All right, and um, let's just go to the bottom. So when we send out the uh, the outgoing invite to them, we populate it with the contact uh, in the contact field. We populate it with the public IP address in port 5060. And here you see down here is the public IP voice port number 7170. All right, what is the effect of changing that? Okay, let's just go ahead and uh, let's do test number nine. Okay, so what's the effect of changing that? Let's change this to, um, so currently it's uh, 244. Let's change it to 111. And we're basically stating that's what my public IP address is. Make the outbound call. And uh, actually, we need to change the SIP parameters as well. Sorry. 111. All right, redial, maintenance. 
Notice the call is not completing, a lot of silence. Let me, uh, I'll go ahead and hang up. So now when we send out the outgoing invite, notice the IP address is now the 111 at both for voice and for RTP. So we're telling the ITSP, when you reply to us, this is where you're going to send the messages back to. And um, we never got a response from the ITSP. So that's uh, the reason why. Okay, so now you can see the effect of that. Uh, we need to change it back to, I think, 244 of your NAT traversal settings. Okay, and use your tools. Okay, you can do a, uh, we'll just wrap this up. But use your tools if you do have problems. Use what's in front of you. You know, uh, one of the tools that we have is that of being able to do a network capture. Okay, capture the packets on the LAN or the WAN. We'll capture everything on the WAN port. And with that, we're going to go ahead and make a phone call. Welcome to Epigee Technologies. If you know the extension of the person you are trying to reach, enter it at any time. For product information and sales information. I'll stop the packet capture. And I'll download the packet capture. It's going to download it in, uh, what do they call it, like a, a TCAP. Uh, it's a dump, a trace. It's a packet capture, basically but it's going to open for you automatically if you have Wireshark installed on your on your PC. Okay, give that a moment. I find this to be uh, quite valuable. Okay, so uh, this is a packet capture. It shows for the duration that I did the capture. It shows how many packets I've captured from packet number one all the way down to however many. You can see the um, in the middle here, you can see the protocol. There's a SIP message. There's an invite going from the QX to the public IP. A response with a trying, a proxy authentication required. All the information that we're looking at, you can also go to uh, telephony, click on VoIP calls, you can find the call, click on it, uh, you can click on the flow sequence, which will show you all the messaging going back and forth, the invite, trying, proxy, uh, authentication required, acknowledge, invite, etc., etc., serves the RTP. All right, so all the messaging that we've been looking at in the logs and then you can also play streams if this is uh, ng 11 it'll open up and you can play the uh, use that for your playback okay i was able to hear it i'm not sure if you were able to hear it or not but i was able to hear the audio so that's a great tool especially if you're having audio issues to uh very easily uh, able to capture all that information, listen to it, verify it, see if it's good, and uh, it'll tell you uh, a lot about what's going on on those calls. You also have uh, under status, you can look at uh, call history, and it'll show various calls and shows the call records whether uh, whether they were good or not, okay? Um, successful, and you can uh, get some information details about that all right so with that that uh, concludes our session today I appreciate everyone joining um, thank you for your time be sure to uh, catch some of those other webinars and uh, everybody I wish you all the best stay safe and uh, we'll look forward to uh, to meeting with you again
If, uh, if there's any questions, I will take those here momentarily. Let me just uh, stop the recording.